Can everybody hear me? Okay. It's really good to be uh, in this place and to see all of you. I'm sure that many of you are quite knowledgeable about uh, the situation in Israel-Palestine. Uh, I thought that uh, rather than uh, give you more facts, additional information, uh, litany of uh, problems and frustrations, I, I wanted to put the situation in a bit of a larger perspective. Not only the global perspective, because in fact it has become a global uh, problem. In fact, the Middle East situation has been caught up in, in, in the major, uh, I would say, struggle that is taking place throughout the world now. But also, I think, in a spiritual sense. And, and I must make myself clear, because when I speak about the spiritual aspects of this problem, I do not mean the religious aspects. Right now, throughout the world, as you know, especially after 9-11, there are many people who think that the world has changed and that now we are caught up in a big worldwide vicious struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. In one sense, I think they are right but not at all in the sense that it has been presented. This is not a religious war of fighting against uh, militant Islam, for example. However, there are those in this country particularly who have used the fear, the panic, the revulsion that occurred in 9-11 to marshal tremendous resources behind their own vision of what is largely an imperial function. Largely a function of creating or setting up a new world system that serves their interest. In one sense, this is similar to what we have seen in our part of the world, where in fact the revulsion and objection that many people have seen to suicide bombings, particularly when they uh, target a civilian as opposed to a military target, this has led to a sense of fear panic, joining together behind the policies of the government, refusing to look to the more serious and deeper issues, and in fact have used it as a tool to justify a whole number of things that really could not and should not be justified. In fact, I will say that during the last four or five years, uh, we who live on the receiving end of this policy in Palestine have seen a very clear shift, a very clear change in direction and in policy. An acceleration under the guise of fighting terrorism of a number of existing policies and trends. A tremendous loosening of the kind of restrictions, restraints, which we believed existed 
before. A speeding up of violations of human rights, expropriation of more land, building up of more uh, I'm all wired up here. <laughs> Building up of more settlements and setting up of a whole new structure while everybody is panicked and afraid and talking about security and the need to, find, uh, to fight terrorism, a whole new system was being established in the occupied territories that I would like to describe to you in a short while that goes by the Hebrew name of Hafrada, separation. A very interesting system that tries to create not the possibilities of a two-state solution, not the possibilities of a reconciliation between Palestinians and Israelis, not a new situation that both sides can somehow manage to coexist together with compromises, give and take on both sides, but unilaterally imposing a new system where each group has its place within a unitary system under direct Israeli domination. Now this system has been slowly evolving over many years, but it has definitely been speeded up the last four or five years, and it has had a tremendous impetus, a tremendous drive from the so-called global war on terrorism. It gave it a new perspective. I just finished reading a book called The One Percent Doctrine by uh, a reporter called Susskind, where he describes how after 9-11, uh, Dick Cheney and others within this present administration created this doctrine that if there's a one percent chance that some major terrorist action may take place, we have to act as if that's a certainty. Facts and evidence are no longer important. What is important is our response and our perceived response to these threats. Now, after four or five years of this doctrine taking effect, people now are beginning to see where it would lead to. It would lead to tremendous reduction in basic freedoms and liberties, an invasion of uh, privacy, not only of foreigners out there, but also within the United States, American citizens, a sense of secrecy so that decisions can be taken in uh, secret, tremendous resources being dedicated to this uh, war against terrorism, and slowly and surely a change in the way this country is run with its views, with its values, with its morality. And one major part of it is a tremendous reduction in acceptance of and reliance on international law, international institutions, international standards of human rights, and the ability of people to question and examine policies even in this country. Now, in my part of the world, this whole experience, uh, this whole new shift in policy has been experienced at, at the daily life in a very 
dilapidating way. Ordinary Palestinians began to feel the heavy weight of the occupation as never before. Because now, not only internationally was there less interest in imposing international standards of human rights and international law, but there was now perceived to be a carte blanche because the United States, the only superpower, has decided to give the green light to Israel to do whatever it chooses. But perhaps more importantly, internally, within Israel itself, many of the forces of liberalism, of human rights interest, of peace-leaning and peace-loving people felt themselves weakened, if not silenced, not by anybody telling them you can't talk, but because they themselves did not feel they could act anymore. So that the normal restraints imposed on Israel internally by its own courts, by its own public opinion, by its own press, somehow were weakened and the average Palestinian began to feel that there is less restraint at that level. But most importantly, the system of Hafrada was being put in place. Hafrada in Hebrew means separation. And separation in this sense is not uh, the Palestinians can have the West Bank and we'll have Israel. No. Within the West Bank, a system was created for Jewish settlers and Palestinian Arabs to live in such a way that there will continue to be Israeli domination of the entire area. Now, one part of this system of Hafrada is, of course, the Jewish settlements themselves. These are areas that were exclusively for Jewish uh, life. Israeli Arabs, for example, or Israeli citizens, are not allowed legally to come into the occupied territories, including the settlements. These settlements, numbering in hundreds of thousands of population now, have their own separate system, their own judicial system, educational system, health system, and a system of roads was created to connect these settlements to one another and to Israel. And many of these roads are exclusively for Jews. Whereas another system was talked about but not quite implemented that would be for the Arabs. There was an attempt to get the European Union to pay for a system of roads for the Arabs to supplant the existing system. But this separate road system the system of exclusive Jewish settlements, and also the wall that was now created was set in such a manner to increase the area that is under total Jewish control in the West Bank and to restrict and surround the areas that were to be left to Arabs to administer. When the elections took place that brought Hamas into majority rule into Palestinian government, this event was plugged into the existing matrix, the existing system of worldwide control, interdiction, and boycott of terrorist organizations. After 9-11, it made sense for this administration to try and locate where Al-Qaeda and the Bin Ladens and the terrorists are throughout the world and make sure that their supplies 
of weapons and money is cut off. And towards that goal, a new financial regime was created, whereby nobody could wire or transfer any amount of money anywhere in the world. I said any, I, the cutoff used to be $10,000. But Nick tells me that he tried to wire $500 to Gaza and his bank could not do it. He had to go through Western Union, which I just learned from this book I mentioned to you, is now continuously and completely monitored in real time by uh, the CIA and this administration. So now, into this system was plugged in the victory of Hamas in the election, which meant that under US law, no American could have any contact or financially benefit in any way the Palestinian National Authority that has just been elected. As a lawyer, I was contacted in panic by a number of humanitarian and church organizations. Uh, and and I, I was told, what can we do now? We cannot pay our taxes to the Palestinian Authority because under US law, that would be viewed as a criminal offense of giving. In fact, we cannot even put stamps on the envelopes because we'll be giving money into an entity that is considered to be uh, a terrorist and an illegitimate entity. For the last seven months, the Palestinian Authority has not been able to pay its teachers, doctors, employees, and public servants so that as of the beginning of September, most of these services have been suspended. They go on strike because they haven't been paid in seven months. Meanwhile, the process of building the wall and expanding the settlements and putting in place the new structure has been going at a very accelerated rate. And people began to feel helpless. People began to feel hopeless. I think that if I were to describe the situation as it was shortly before the Lebanon war, I would say there's complete despair and despondency. As if the powers that were marshaled against the Palestinian people uh, have been overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. Uh, the United Nations is almost totally irrelevant. The Arab countries paralyzed by their own uh, failure to do anything substantive. The peace process, what peace process? It doesn't exist. In fact, uh, since the death of Arafat, uh, even though Mahmoud Abbas was very acceptable to the Israeli authorities, they were also treating him as irrelevant. They were not meeting with him. Nothing was happening uh, at that front either. And the Palestinians <coughs> felt nothing is going on. Now, I think everybody knows what the solution to this Israeli-Palestinian conflict is. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, President Clinton, uh, former President Clinton, just mentioned it offhandedly in a, in a television debate. Everybody knows what the solution is, plus or minus 5%. Everybody knows what needs to be done to bring an end to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Somewhere along the two-state solution, there has to be uh, mutual uh, acceptance. There has to be a dismantlement of the settlement. There has to be 
a sharing of Jerusalem, there has to be some kind of resolution, a fair resolution to the situation of the uh, refugees. However, even though everybody knows that that's more or less the outlines of the solution, there is absolutely no movement towards that solution. To the contrary, there is a daily active installation of the Hafrada regime, which is meant to be a long-term permanent domination of Israel over all this area with the delegation to an acceptable Palestinian partner to take care of keeping his people in line within the small enclaves that have been delegated to them. Not a negotiated solution, a unilaterally created and imposed solution. Now, it is at this stage when one understands the realities on the ground and when one sees the tremendous magnitude of forces that are marshaled behind this plan that, in my view, the issue becomes a spiritual issue. What do I mean by that? Sabil is a Christian organization. Sabil is a Palestinian Christian organization that believes that the gospel is good news. That in the teachings and preachings and actions and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is a vision of God's purpose for us in the world today. We recognize and we know that the majority of people in our neck of the woods are Muslims and Jews who may not share this particular vision. But we also believe that the God that we worship is also the same God that's worshipped by Jews and by Muslims. And that he is a just God. And that his desire for his children, all of his children, is one for peace, for reconciliation, for a good life, and not a life of oppression, or domination. In this sense, we as Christians hold on to a view or a vision that is not based on victory in the sense of militarily vanquishing and dominating your enemies. This is what is wrong, by the way, with the vision of this administration about the war on terror. It is not based on creating a new, open, democratic world. It's based on creating a world where America is strong and powerful and intimidates and forces everyone into doing their will. They may call it democracy, but the reality is otherwise. In Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, the goal is not democracy. The goal is not freedom. The goal is U.S. domination. In that sense, in that sense, we as Christians, and I also include all of you as North American Christians, need to be directly and immediately engaged in this fight, engaged in this struggle. But it is not a fight to dominate and win and impose your will on others. It is a fight to create a new world that is closer to God's vision 
of what he wants for his children in the world today. In this sense, to go back to my topic for today, to our situation in the Middle East, we as Christians need to be heavily involved on the side of justice, on the side of truth, because truth is one of the most wonderful and powerful weapons to be used in this battle. St. Paul talks about the weapons of light against the forces of darkness. And what is more a weapon of light than truth, than unmasking the myths, unmasking the fear, unmasking the lies, unmasking the policies that are cooked in darkness, that do not allow open and free discussion and debate, that appeal to one's fear and one's loyalty, patriotism, tribal and ethnic belonging at the risk or at the expense of those values that are universal, at the expense of the values that are open to the other, to the neighbor, to the foreigner, to the one who is not a member of our particular religion, denomination, or national ethnicity. This is a whole new level of engaging in this battle. I also believe that this battle has to be a non-violent battle. This is not a battle of weapons, better and more sophisticated and more destructive weapons with which to attack your enemies. It is a battle that is based on principles, values, the hearts and minds, the spirit that drives and keeps people going. For this reason, I may switch to the United States, for America to be safe and secure, you don't need to build more weapons. You, you need to build more friends. You need to build more trust. You need to build more acceptance of universal principles that help and serve everyone, not just your own interest. For this reason, the United Nations becomes important again. For this reason, international law becomes of tremendous importance. For this reason, human rights as a value and as a standard and as a requirement to be imposed especially against the powerful, not to be used as a, a stick with which to threaten the weak countries to get involved in their internal affairs, but to ignore the human rights violations by our friends and allies and our supporters under whatever pretense or pretext. Going back to our situation, where does that place us? I submit to you that for whatever reasons, when the Israeli people, and especially, especially those on the left, those in the Labour Party or in the Merits Party, those who traditionally have talked about peace with the Palestinians and about trying to solve the problem. When they line up behind a right-wing, fascist-leaning government, when they support uh, policies 
and practices that are made, aimed at crushing the Palestinian people. When they support measures that take advantage of the war on terrorism to get away with grabbing more land, with destroying more houses, with setting up and speeding up this wall that the International Court of Justice has declared to be an illegal wall. When they go ahead and proceed with establishing Hafrada, I think they are making a big mistake for themselves as well as for the Palestinians. When they support and allow the practice of assassinations, so-called targeted killings, and never mind the collateral damage, we're allowed to do that. We're going after a legitimate target and anybody else who happens to be around, tough, too bad for them. When they try to use the separation, as they did in Gaza, as an excuse, we already withdrew from Gaza, we have nothing to do with it. Why are they still shooting at us when they are continuously strangulating the entire population? When they justify destroying the infrastructure, not only in Gaza, they also tried the same policy in Lebanon, and it has failed there as well destroying bridges, destroying power stations, destroying the ports, destroying the infrastructure as a way of pressuring the population or pressuring their governments. When they follow this policy, they are following a policy, perhaps understandable from a secular human perspective. It shows power. We are showing them who is boss. We are showing them who has the might? How dare they oppose us? They have to know that the price of opposing us is tremendous. Ten times, hundred times casualties we impose on them for imposing casualties on us or, or kidnapping our soldiers or hitting our civilians or targeting our settlers. We will show them what we can do. I submit that when they do that, they are pursuing the wrong policy. Now, people may debate with me. And in secular terms, it would be a very difficult debate because it will be based on what works and what doesn't. What policy is effective and what isn't. And we have those debates all the time. And you are going to have all these debates in the United States now. Torture, does it work or doesn't? Does it yield information or doesn't? Is this, does it work? And if it does work, then somehow it is uh, justified because it gives us what we want. Uh, in this book, towards the end, Susskind uh, quotes a... Uh, uh, verse from the Old Testament which says justice, justice ye shall pursue. And he says that the rabbis have all agreed that the word justice is used twice, not only for emphasis, but because justice has to be the goal as well as the means. Both must be just, otherwise you end up being as bad as the people you are trying to fight. I submit to you that in secular terms, there may be some kind of debate as to this present policy. But in religious, spiritual terms, there is no debate. Because we believe in God. And we believe that God is sovereign over this universe. And we believe that God is ultimately in control. Not Washington, not Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, not the oil rich sheikhs or kings, not the multinational corporations. It is not the number of weapons of tanks or sophisticated weapons that you have. 
It is not your fighter planes and your navy that is ultimately in control. It is God who is in control. Incidentally, this is not entirely a Christian doctrine. <laughs> Jews believe the same. Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Maybe news to you, but Muslims believe the same. <coughs> Allahu Akbar that they keep repeating is often mistranslated into English that Allah is great. No. Allahu Akbar is accurately translated, God is greater. <coughs> Allahu Akbar, Allah Washington. Allahu Akbar over the occupation. Allahu Akbar over the corrupt leader. Allahu Akbar over this wall that is being imposed to imprison us. Allahu Akbar over the current situation that we are suffering every day and we feel utterly helpless and utterly in despair. It is our faith that God is ultimately greater and more powerful than those forces that keeps us going. Now, there are those who try to use religious language to justify their vision of victory and domination. We know that. We have it in this country as well, don't we? And there are those Muslims who use this theology to justify more violence against the others. And there are, I suspect, Jews who also use that God is with us and somehow God gave us all those rights to justify again a domination. At Sabil, we believe differently. We believe that accepting God's ultimate sovereignty does not mean that he is on our side, but that we have to work very hard to be on his side. And that has very specific, concrete applications. It is not just a slogan. What does it mean to be on God's side in the Middle East? Well, I know the Pat Boone's and the Hal Lindsey's and uh, the 700 Club, they, they, they think God is on Israel's side and that as Christians we have to support Israel, send them more weapons, support them, not allow them, God forbid, to make compromises, to give away that which God has given them. That's how they see the view. The Christian Zionist view is very clear and one of the things that we try to do uh, at Sabil consistently and all the time is to try and address and challenge Christian Zionism as being against real Christian principles. But what does it mean concretely for us to say we are seeking to be on God's side in the Middle East? I think I can name a few elements. I cannot tell you that God wants the two-state solution. <laughs> I can tell you that the two-state solution comes a lot closer to what God would want than the current situation or than the utter domination by one side of the other and their extermination and ethnic cleansing and pushing them into the sea or into the desert or denying their legitimacy. That I can tell you. I think that seeking God's will for the Middle East and actively working towards it would include a number of elements. First and foremost is a genuine love for all the people in the Middle East. You cannot exclude from God's love the Jews or the Palestinians or the Muslims. <laughs> You must seek a solution that reflects God's love for everyone. I think that that vision also includes rejection of those ideologies 
and policies that discriminate any of these groups. That's why as a Christian, Palestinian Christian, yes, but as a Christian generally, I say that anti-Semitism is a sin. Hatred of Jews as Jews is totally and contrary to God's will. Do we dare to say that also Islamophobia and hatred of Arabs and Palestinians, stereotyping and discriminating against them, is also sinful and that we as Christians should have nothing to do with it. Can we say that those roads that are just for Jews and other roads for non-Jews, for Palestinians, or any form of, I hesitate to, wear, to use the word apartheid because in many ways the situation of Hafrada in many ways is very different, in fact much worse than the South African apartheid regime. But there are certainly elements of that policy that are so repugnant to what we as Christians would think God's view for the Middle East would be. I think another element of seeking God's will in the Middle East would run counter and against all forms of violence. I have no problem as a Christian saying that non-violence is definitely the way and the path. We need to be able to say that not only to the Palestinians. Don't go violence. Violence is no good. It's against God's will. Can we say that also to the Israelis? Is it possible? Do we dare? Knowing what they've gone through, knowing that they've gone through the Holocaust, knowing that they, two minutes, that they mistrust other people. But that's certainly an element of the good news. See, the gospel is good news. It's supposed to be good news. Good news not only for us as Christians, but good news for Muslims and good news for Jews, good news for Israelis, good news for Palestinians. Where's the good news here? The good news is that our God is a God of justice, our God is a God of love, our God is a God of nonviolence, our God is a God of equality, our God is a God who cares for the weak and who cares for the poor even if they have no oil, <laughs> even if they elected as foolishly as the Israelis elected with their leadership, God still loves them. God cares that they have electricity, that they have medical supplies, that they have freedom of movement, that they can get to the hospital, get to the school, get to their friend's wedding, get to come into the country and leave it with reasonable searches and not utter humiliation or utter denial. Absolute denial. You're not allowed back into the country. A goal and a view of God's children living together. Living together. In human dignity, with their human rights respected, with their ability to participate in determining their fate, to elect and choose even if they choose poorly, not to be totally and utterly strangulated by those who have the power, who have the means, who have the weapons, who have the support of the superpower to do what they want. I'm told my time is up, but I want to finish on a slightly more hopeful uh, note, if I may. And that is that despite everything that is happening, there continues to be among the Palestinian people today, despite everything, a majority that still has not given up the hope 
that still continues to have faith in God, that somehow, despite all evidence to the contrary, despite the utter weakness of our situation, the perfidy of our friends, and the ineffectiveness of our leaders, despite the total ignoring of our claims by the international community, that God is still there and that justice will somehow prevail. It is my ardent prayer that these people in our community will be strengthened and that we will be able to find people on the other side who also will believe and act on the belief that their security cannot be secured by oppressing us, by overpowering us, by more military weapons, by more walls, more checkpoints, more oppression, but rather by creating the trust, creating the friends on the other side that will allow us to live together. Thank you.